areas. Uh, the situation is still quite dynamic and we need to remain vigilant. For continuous coverage, stay with ABC News 24. For decades, dietary fat and cholesterol have been the villains in heart disease. You very seldom see the word saturated fat in the public press when they're not associated with artery clogging. So it's, it's like it's all one term, artery clogging saturated fats. But now some medical experts are coming forward to challenge this medical paradigm. I think it's a huge misconception that saturated fat and cholesterol are the demons in the diet, and it is 100% wrong. Saturated fat has been vilified for years because of the cholesterol theory. A multi-billion dollar food industry has fueled our phobia of fat and cholesterol and dramatically influenced our diet. That's not science, that's marketing. It's lived past its expiration date and it's one of these hypotheses that just won't die. Have we all been conned? In this episode, I'll follow the road which led us to believe that saturated fat and cholesterol cause heart disease and reveal why it's been touted as the biggest myth in medical history. The food industry has shaped our ideas about heart health with TV ads like this one. So join me in the Uncle Toby's Oats Cholesterol Challenge. Lowering our cholesterol has been a running theme with the food industry. People have this fear of cholesterol because they've been bombarded with it so much uh, in the media that it's bad and it's going to cause heart disease. That's why all these things are emblazoned with cholesterol free. These advertising campaigns are at the behest of our peak health authorities. The National Heart Foundation guidelines are pretty clear. We're told to reduce our saturated fat and cholesterol levels in order to reduce our risk of heart disease. But many doctors are now suggesting we need to radically rethink this approach. One of those doctors challenging this medical dogma is California-based nutritionist Dr Johnny Bowden. When you look at the data, it's very clear everything that we have been told about saturated fat and cholesterol is a bold-faced lie. It's just not so. But isn't there good science behind this? If you look at the science that actually the dietary guidelines were based on, the early stuff this was so badly done, so filled with confirmation bias, it would never even pass muster today. And unfortunately, most doctors don't know this. Dr. Ernest Curtis is astonished at how medicine has gilded the lily on cholesterol. During medical school, I was taught the same thing everybody else was, the importance of cholesterol and so forth, and I saw no reason to doubt it. But once I got into the cardiology field itself, I was seeing people with heart attacks that had cholesterol all over the place, high cholesterol, low cholesterol, the metal, it didn't seem, didn't seem to matter. And at first I thought, well, okay, these are probabilities, so there'll be exceptions. But it turned out that after a while I was seeing far too many exceptions. So that motivated me to go back and look at the origins of these theories. And quite frankly, given the certainty with which we were taught this, it surprised me to find out how poor the evidence was, it virtually non-existent. <laughs> Cardiologist Dr. Stephen Sinatra said he routinely ordered patients to lower their cholesterol with medications, but now admits he was wrong. I used to be the poster boy for the drug companies, and when I was chief of cardiology, I used to write for statins all the time. I really believed in the cholesterol theory of heart disease. I first became skeptical of the cholesterol theory in like the mid-80s. I was doing coronary angiograms, and you know, you place a tube in the groin, and goes up into the heart, and you can see if this blockage is there. So sometimes I would do the angiogram on a person with a high cholesterol, thinking I was going to find a lot of disease, and I, many times I didn't find disease. And the converse was true. You know, I, I would do somebody with a low cholesterol and expecting not to find disease, and I found disease. So I was starting to think 
Maybe I don't have this right. Maybe cholesterol is not the enemy we think it is. We've become so paranoid about cholesterol, we've actually forgotten it's essential for life. It's a major component of brain and nerve tissue and central for the production of hormones. In fact, it's so important that virtually every single cell in the body makes it. Aside from people with a genetic condition like familial hypercholesterolemia, diet has long been the focus of how we can lower our cholesterol. The idea that saturated fat clogs your arteries by raising cholesterol first gained traction in the 50s. American nutritionist Ansel Keys became intrigued with the soaring rates of heart disease after World War II. The facts are simple. You know the chief killer of Americans is cardiovascular disease. He compared the rates of heart disease and fat consumption in six countries. It was almost a perfect correlation. The more fat people ate, the higher the rates of heart disease. Except there was just one problem. Keyes withheld data for 16 other countries. Later, when researchers plotted all 22 countries, the correlation wasn't so perfect. Dr. Michael Eads is critical of the way Ansel Keyes excluded countries that didn't fit his hypothesis. He more or less cherry-picked countries you could show just the opposite. You could show that the more saturated fat people ate, the less heart disease they had if you cherry pick the right countries. Dr. Eads says that even if fat consumption trends in the same direction as heart disease, it doesn't prove anything. Just because there's a correlation doesn't mean that there's causation. It's like people who are fat have big belts, but that doesn't mean that if you go and buy a smaller belt, you won't be fat. I mean, that's not causation. You know, that's what these observational studies show, is just a correlation. The classic study by Ansel Keys is a textbook example of fudging the data to get the result that you want out of a study. And unfortunately, there's a lot of that that goes on. Science writer Gary Taubes says it's all very well to have a theory, but in science, you have to prove it. And they tried. And over the next 15 years, uh, researchers did uh, trial after trial, and there were probably a half a dozen of them between 1960 and 1975, all refuted or failed to confirm the idea that you could live longer by either reducing the saturated fat in your diet or reducing the total fat in your diet. The American Heart Association was also reluctant to lend credence to Key's theory, but then he managed to score a position on the association's advisory panel, where he pushed for the acceptance of his ideas, and it wasn't long before they had a change of heart. Instead of the data not being good enough to claim that dietary fat was a cause of heart disease, they concluded that the data were good enough and therefore uh, all Americans over the age of two should go on low-fat diets. As the idea gained widespread acceptance with the public, science was left to catch up. Two ambitious trials costing over $250 million involving hundreds of thousands of patients both failed to prove that lowering saturated fat could reduce your risk of dying from a heart attack. The way the authorities responded to this was to claim that they must have done the study wrong. Instead of saying, hey, look, eating a low-fat diet doesn't apparently do anything for people, or certainly not women, instead they respond by putting out press releases saying, look, we don't know why this trial failed to confirm our hypothesis, but it doesn't mean that the advice we've been giving you is wrong, and it doesn't mean that the hypothesis that dietary fat causes heart disease is wrong. The National Heart Foundation of Australia defends these failures, saying that nutrition trials are just too complex. We need to ask that question of, do dietary fats increase heart disease? You're um, sort of trying to negate all the other risk factors that in fact actually also cause heart disease. So to imagine creating a study that would prove that conclusively, it's virtually impossible. <laughs> 
So if they can't prove it, on what basis have they decided that saturated fat is bad for us? Eat too much fatty food and you risk a high level of blood cholesterol building up in your arteries. Eat sensibly. Meta-analyses have in fact actually shown that you know, we can say with convincing evidence that uh, intake of saturated fats leads to an increase in blood cholesterol. An extensive review of the literature showed the data was highly inconsistent. In fact, there were many long-term studies that refute the idea that saturated fat raises cholesterol. So I approached the National Heart Foundation for further evidence. They said the data was complex. They cited one study which showed only certain types of saturated fat could raise bad cholesterol, but it also raised good cholesterol. In the end, they concluded, we agree, we are limited by the evidence base available at this time. Study called the Heart Study. I asked Australia's leading lipid expert what he thought. So should we be giving people dietary advice if there is such poor adherence and the studies aren't available? I think there are uh, some very telling pieces of evidence which have been used to establish the, the importance of avoiding saturated fat. If saturated fat is completely benign, if it's actually beneficial, where's the evidence in support of that? Where's the evidence of an alternative cause? And we are particularly keen to get some dietary advice because otherwise, what do we offer people? But Dr Curtis disagrees with giving people dietary advice when he believes the evidence is insufficient. He says diet has very little influence on your blood cholesterol in the long term. The reason for that is that your body manufactures 80 to 90 percent of your cholesterol. Really very little of it comes from the diet. Most people seem to have a genetically preset level for the cholesterol in their body and it, and it may be in a range but uh, they're generally going to seek to stay within that range. So if somebody cuts all the cholesterol out of their diet, their body will simply start making a little bit more to bring it back up into the range. In the 60s, British physician John Newtkin challenged Key's theory, claiming that sugar was the culprit in heart disease, not saturated fat. But Keyes was politically powerful and publicly discredited Yudkin's theory. By the early 1970s, Ansel Keyes was ridiculing John Yudkin and his theory in papers. And just on the basis of that sort of personality and political struggle, the nutrition community embraced this idea that saturated fat was the problem, working through dietary cholesterol, and began to think of the idea that sugar could cause heart disease as akin to quackery. And Yudkin was eventually ridiculed. Keyes won the diet war, helped by his rise to fame after appearing on the cover of Time magazine. This widespread publicity meant that Key's theory went from weak hypothesis to medical dogma. It would turn out to be one of the most significant events in the history of post-war medicine. The consequences of this study would reverberate over the next several decades to influence public opinion, government policy and the way doctors practice medicine today. The most influential and respected investigation into the potential causes of heart disease was carried out here in the town of Framingham, Massachusetts. It began in 1948 and is still going on today. It's the longest observational study of its kind, involving over 5,000 residents. The Framingham data pointed out very early that certain habits or what you did, like cigarette smoking or emotional stress, did point in the direction of heart disease. But then something happened. Some of these Framingham residents were living longer than others. When researchers went to look at the data 30 years later, they found that after a certain age, it didn't matter what your cholesterol level was. Cholesterol did correlate with heart disease, but that disappeared by the time you reached your late 40s. After the age of 47, high cholesterol is probably protective. The people who had the highest cholesterol lived the longest, much to the amazement of a lot of the researchers. People who ate the most cholesterol, ate the most fat, actually weighed the less and were the most active. One of the Framingham researchers became so dismayed with the results 
he wrote a scathing review of the whole diet heart hypothesis, saying that people had been misled by the greatest scientific deception of our times, the notion that animal fat causes heart disease. Hundreds of articles refuting the cholesterol hypothesis have been published in the world's leading medical journals, but they rarely get noticed by mainstream media. What you do in bad science is you ignore any evidence that's contrary to your beliefs, your hypothesis, and you only focus on the evidence that supports it. In 1977, the US government stepped in. Senator George McGovern, an advocate of Ansel Keys' theory, headed a committee hearing to end the debate once and for all. And they are the ones that really have put us in the nutritional mess that we're in now because based on virtually zero science, they decided that a low-fat diet was the best thing for us all. Eminent scientists at the time disagreed with the report. That's why I have pleaded in my report and will plead again orally here for more research on the problem before we make announcements to the American public. But their pleas fell on deaf ears. Well, I, I would only argue that senators don't have the luxury that a research scientist does of waiting until every last shred of uh, evidence is in. News reports began peddling the same message. And many say it was this article in Time magazine that put the final nail in the coffin for saturated fat and cholesterol. This led to the creation of the Food Pyramid, which formed the basis of our dietary advice in the following four decades. It advised us to eat less saturated fat, mainly found in meat and dairy, recommending a diet rich in carbohydrate foods like breads, grains and cereals. McGovern himself was from a big wheat growing state, so it didn't hurt him politically that uh, people moved away from uh, foods of animal origin into breads and, and pastas. There is one diet that stands out from the rest, the Leon Diet Heart Study, which touted the benefits of a Mediterranean diet. Remarkably, after several years, those on the Mediterranean diet had a whopping 76% less deaths from heart attacks. So why did the Mediterranean diet get such a spectacular result when all the others had failed? I'll explain why later, but one of the most interesting things to come from that study went virtually unnoticed. Here's the part that nobody talks about. So you'd think that in the group that had the double-digit reduction in heart disease, their cholesterol levels must have plummeted, right? The cholesterol levels didn't budge. Both groups had the same cholesterol levels, except one group just stopped dying. So, so much for the relationship between cholesterol and the risk for heart disease. This is the average amount of saturated fat a person consumes in a month. Atherosclerosis begins when plaques build up in the arteries. If saturated fat can clog this pipe, imagine what it's doing to yours. But contrary to popular belief, neither saturated fat or cholesterol deposit on the artery wall like sludge in a pipe. Nobody knows what begins the process, but damage on the artery wall causes inflammation. The body responds by recruiting cells to fix the problem. Tissue cells called macrophages clean up the debris, which consists of things like bacteria, calcium and cholesterol. A fibrous cap grows over the plaque trying to conceal the inflammation. If the cap bursts, the plaque's contents are released and a clot may block the artery, after which a heart attack ensues. Dr Curtis has a theory on what initiates the damage that begins atherosclerosis. Arteries are constantly branching off one from another and at these branch points is a very common place to find these plaques. The study of fluid dynamics shows this is where the artery experiences the most stress from the tremendous pulsatile force of blood coursing through the artery at high pressure. Veins don't endure the same pressure as arteries, so they never develop plaques. 
the veins that simply return the used up blood to the heart to get reoxygenated and then not under the same stress. And veins don't develop atherosclerosis unless you put them in a situation where they have to function as arteries. And this may happen when surgeons use veins in heart bypass surgery. Now that portion of the vein is receiving the same arterial pressures. Those coronary bypass grafts and veins here will develop atherosclerosis very quickly. It is never seen in their native state. But because cholesterol is found in the plaques, it's often blamed for causing it. If you go in and you do autopsies of people who have had coronary artery disease and you cut open the coronary arteries, they're filled with cholesterol. So it's not a big leap to say, gosh, I shouldn't eat that because it's gonna go right into there, but that's not the way it works. Dr. Sinatra says blaming cholesterol for causing plaques is like blaming firemen for causing fires, just because they're always at the scene. Cholesterol is really not the villain. I mean, we, we, we need it to live. The problem is, is cholesterol is involved in a repair process. Look, cholesterol is found at the scene of the crime. It's not the perpetrator. And where I sit now as a cardiologist, practicing cardiology for over four decades, it's very low down on my list of risk factors. Cholesterol is a waxy substance that doesn't dissolve in the blood, so it has to be ferried around by proteins, mainly LDL and HDL. LDL is said to deliver cholesterol to the tissues, hence it's bad, and HDL is said to remove cholesterol from plaques, hence it's good. You know, small needles are good. But when Dr Sinatra has his annual blood test, he says he's not that concerned about cholesterol. What about the bad cholesterol? You call it the LDL, bad cholesterol? Well, you know, I don't really call it bad unless it's oxidized. Remember, if it's oxidized, then it's inflammatory. So cholesterol's not bad only if it's oxidized? Exactly. If the cholesterol is oxidized, if there's free radical stress involved and it's oxidized, that's inflammatory and that sets the cascade for inflammation. Well, the inflammatory theory of heart disease, I think, is accepted more and more now. I think the general cardiovascular community is still focusing on cholesterol. They need to focus more on inflammation. And that's where, you know, emotional stress, but sugar, sugar is really the foe when it comes to cardiovascular disease. You see, we placed all this emphasis on cholesterol. We've taken it off sugar. And that's the problem. Then you're getting more insulin responses. And we know that insulin is the number one indicator for inducing what we call inflammation of blood vessels. Sugar is far more damaging to the heart than fat ever was. And we're beginning to see this now. So this focus on cholesterol has been incredibly destructive because we haven't looked at these real promoters of heart disease, inflammation, oxidative damage, sugar in the diet, and number one with a bullet stress. Dr. Grenfell says these theories are untested, but plausible. These are still hypothetical uh, uh, questions that uh, need to be answered about why does high blood pressure cause damage to the artery walls. I mean, these are all fantastic ideas and how fantastic it would be if we, uh, we found that uh, there were simple ways of preventing heart disease by lowering our body's inflammatory response and also its enthusiasm to, in this hypothesis, to heal itself or to heal holes in the arteries. So it's also plausible that maybe cholesterol isn't the driving factor in this process. It's a contributor. Dr Sullivan does concede that an aspect of the food pyramid was a mistake. He says replacing fats with carbohydrates didn't help the rising obesity problem. If you replace fat with carbohydrate, uh, you will probably uh, be a little bit more inclined to be hungry. Your insulin levels will be a bit higher. You'll have higher levels of triglyceride, higher levels of glucose, and less of your good cholesterol to avert problems. We certainly probably gave some advice, which was a good way to avert one pathway, but people then tracked down another pathway, and that's what's led to the revision of dietary guidelines. The more recent advice is to replace saturated fat with unsaturated fats in order to lower the risk of heart disease. For example, swapping butter with margarine. 
It's very hard to find any positives about butter in terms of its uh, impact on cardiovascular disease. But this advice still receives its fair share of opposition. Margarine is a perfect example of the stupidest nutritional swap out in history. We have this trans fat laden, crappy manufactured product that we were eating because we were so phobic about saturated fat and cholesterol. To switch to polyunsaturated fats with the vegetable oils, that's horrific advice. The polyunsaturated fats, the vegetable oils, these omega-6 oils are inflammatory because they're very prone to oxidation. Have we been given the wrong advice? <laughs> We've absolutely been given the wrong advice. People became afraid of saturated fats, so they said, okay, we've got to do something to replace the saturated fats, and so let's do it with vegetable oils. Well, vegetable oils don't have the same cooking qualities that saturated fats do. Polyunsaturated fats have a lot of double bonds in them, and double bonds are prone to free radical attack. It becomes a rancid fat, and it becomes really bad for you. And saturated fats, on the other hand, have no double bonds. That's why they're incredibly stable. That's why they're great for cooking. That's why they're great for frying. And that's why they don't really perpetuate free radical cascades in the body, because they're inert fats. They're mainly just Dr. Eads says fat. butter and coconut are not this harmful to your health and recommends those fats over the omega-6 vegetable oils. When vegetable oils are used to manufacture margarine, they undergo a process called partial hydrogenation, which results in the formation of industrial trans fats, and everybody agrees they're bad for you. It's important to look for products that have them removed, although Australia doesn't have mandatory labelling of them. Junk food, for example, is riddled with industrial trans fats. The omega-3s, another type of polyunsaturated fat found in fish, for example, are thought to counter the inflammatory effects of omega-6s. The two of them are kind of like the accelerator and a brake pedal on a car, and if they're in balance, uh, things operate smoothly. I mean, you don't want too much anti-inflammatory, you don't want too much pro-inflammatory. Because of the advent of vegetable oils, we now have tons of omega-6 fats and really very little omega-3 fats. This is thought to be why the Mediterranean diet was so successful. It was higher in omega-3 fats, not to mention it was low in refined carbohydrates like sugar and rich in antioxidants. The Heart Foundation still suggests uh, that a diet that substitutes saturated fats for polyunsaturated fats is one that is healthier for your heart. Pursue it. But opposition to this advice is still palpable. It took decades to really entrench this myth. It's probably going to take a few more decades to get us out of this myth. But to vilify saturated fats, um, I think, is one of the worst things the medical profession has done. I'd love to see the medical establishment saying, whoops, we were wrong. That's not going to happen. Uh, frankly, <laughs> that generation is going to have to die off. And perhaps uh, the generation coming up can, can do better. We created this new disease called hypercholesterolemia. And if we created this new disease, we got to create drugs to neutralize it. So are there corporations and billions of dollars and, and, and money behind this? Absolutely. Next week on Catalyst, I find out why medications to lower cholesterol have become one of the most widely prescribed drugs in the history of medicine. Tomorrow on ABC News Breakfast, Sydney's Opera House turns 40. We'll bring you all the highlights from the birthday celebrations. And we look at the history of another wonder of the world, what lies beneath the beauty of the Great Barrier Reef. We hope you can join us then. Rupert Murdoch, one of the most powerful media moguls and recently re-elected chairman of 21st Century Fox. His speeches send ripples through the international media. Now, see him speak live on home turf. Rupert Murdoch, live from the Lowy Institute, Thursday on ABC News 24.
Public debate over the death penalty only brings harm. Favouring austerity is the main weapon in the fight to save the euro. The leaders still haven't found the...